us take our Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Luke in the New Testament, Luke chapter number 13. I'll be reading there in just a moment. And again, uh, thank you for uh, coming today. It's so good to have guests with us today. And uh, thank you for all the church family for all your work this past week. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, I had a meeting on the calendar for over a year, and then it kind of collided some with the community activities. So I was in San Francisco area preaching and got back as quick as I could, got involved in some of the activities. Uh, but um, I, I landed uh, I landed on Thursday, and I wanted to hustle and get in on the uh, picking up the trash in the Greenway. You all had already dismissed and went on in and started picking up your trash. And I got there, and I met up with Joel's group because I wanted to pick up the trash with my grandson, Braxton. And so when we finished that, um, we wanted to go to eat together. I'd been gone for a few days, and so Braxton got in, in his car, got his car seat in the back of my truck, and he wanted to ride with Paul Paul. And so uh, I understand I'd been on an airplane uh, flying about 700 miles an hour at 30,000 feet. I'd been driving in San Francisco traffic for three days, and I came back to the borough. And uh, I was approaching a stop, sound a little too fast, and my wife said, she said, you, 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 you settle down, you're too rough. And from the back seat, he said, yeah, Paul, Paul, you're too rough. Then every time I hit a bump, Paul, 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 you're too rough, rough, Paul, settle down, Paul, Paul. <laughs> so, you, know, you never know what kids are going to say. Just about everything. Other than, just a few weeks ago, he just saying, you hit cars, Paul, Paul, you hit cars. I don't hit cars, but she says, you're going to hit that car, and so he just assumes I hit cars. And so now he says, I'm too rough a driver, and boy, you never know what they're going to say. Uh, my son was telling me just the other day that uh, he, he uh, brings water in where he sleeps, where Braxton sleeps and sets it there by the bed. And uh, so the other morning, or the night, they were getting ready to bed, go to bed, and everybody was in there for family devotions. And so he had taken a sip of that water, and he said, uh, he said, that's not fresh. He said, Mama, go get me fresh water. And, and uh, uh, Lauren looked at Joel, and she said, you know where he gets that from. And uh, my wife believes in fresh water, fresh coffee, and she's always freshening things up. And Braxton drinks Sprite. And so whenever uh, she'll tell me, uh, uh, honey, go in and get him a fresh Sprite. This Sprite's, Sprite's not fresh. And so, uh, so she said, Lauren said to Joel, she said, you know where he gets that from. And Braxton said, no, no. Said, uh, let me tell you, I get that from Nana. I get that from Nana. <laughs> Let's stand together, please, read God's word. You, you never know what these kids are going to say. <laughs> One teacher was standing in front of her class, and she was trying to explain the circulation of the body, the blood in the body. And she said to her class, she said, Now, uh, if, uh, if I stand on my head, uh, all the blood will run to my head and turn red. And all the class said, Yes, yes. And, uh, she, said, uh, and she said, Okay. She said, Why is it when I stand up um, uh, and... Uh, stand on my feet that my face doesn't turn red and she said because your your head is empty <laughs> I think I got that right I'm not sure but you know the point <laughs> look at verse number 34 now I'm going to read a verse right here and immediately you're going to say whoa boy man what a verse that is but if you'll trust me I want to show you today the the heart for the Lord uh, has for cities and for his city Jerusalem and uh Look at verse 34, and let's read this together, verse 34. And we see the heart cry of Jesus for us. Let's read that together in unison. Ready? O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I want to speak on the subject today for just a while, the Lord's heart for our city. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word, and I pray that you'll bless, please, the reading of it. And I pray you'll challenge us to see just how you feel for the individuals of not just our city, but every city. I ask you, Lord, please, for the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray you'll give us your mind, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. 
Here at Franklin Road Baptist Church, I can say with all of my heart that we love the borough. We genuinely do. Many of us here have the privilege to travel from time to time to other cities in America, and all of you that do so would agree with me that we live in a very blessed and privileged place. And I'm always happy to get home to Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I remember years ago, I was with Brother Chapel out in Lancaster, California, there in the high desert. And uh, the sun was going down there in the desert, and he looked at me, he said, Boy, Brother Norris, isn't this the most beautiful place in the world? And I said, No. I said, It's awful. He said, What do you mean? I said, Well, the hairs burn off and everything. It looks like they dropped a napalm bomb on this place. I said, When I fly into Nashville, there's beautiful trees and hills and so forth. And so we live in a beautiful place here in Murfreesboro. Our beautiful growing city has so much to offer. The preachers that were here for Southwide uh, just a few weeks ago were taken back by all the restaurant uh, opportunities and the hotels, all the shopping and the beautiful cleanliness of our town, well manicured. And we live in a very, very safe place, a very friendly city. And I believe we still enjoy the charm of Southern hospitality here. And uh, we enjoy the robust economy, economy with jobs everywhere and the safety of our policemen and firemen and protection there. The opportunity for leisure uh, activities and tourism and entertainment abounds. I mean, what is there not to love about Murfreesboro, Tennessee? And this is why I believe that we rank in the top 20 for preferred locations to live in in America. And it is amazing that me and my wife uh, and our family gets to call this home. It is uh, a, a wonderful place. And we got up this morning to the beautiful morning. And again, we're grateful for our town, Murfreesboro. Few people know how to pronounce the name of it. They don't know how to spell it. <laughs> but thank God for Murfreesboro, Tennessee. <clears throat> and, uh, but uh, uh, because I'm a born-again Christian and because <clears throat> I'm a gospel preacher, uh, I have a deeper love for my city. And you as a Christian should as well. For me, Murfreesboro is not just my home. It is my mission field. I hope you think of it like that. And don't uh, get me wrong in this. Our city... Uh, is uh, also the location for the mission of many organizations, not just the church. There are business missions that take place here. People come here, <laughs> and they launch their businesses, and they have a mission with that. Entertainment missions uh, progress from here. Education missions, people by the thousands come here on a mission to receive their education. And the medical missions, and tourism missions, and Retirement missions, people come here to retire. <laughs> you see, everyone has a purpose or a mission for why they live here in our town. So I have a deeper love for my city because of my spiritual mission and because of my biblical mission. Because, you see, I, like many of you, uh, want everyone that lives uh, here to know how they can have eternal life and someday not just enjoy this city, but go to a heavenly city someday. And our choir was singing about that so beautifully today. And can I say that that is what Jesus wanted for the inhabitants here of Jerusalem in verse number 34. In our passage today, Jesus, along with his disciples, are making their way toward Jerusalem, the holy city of the world, and by the way, it still is. And he had just preached a scorching message exposing the Pharisees as false teachers. If you compare chapter or, or, uh, Matthew there, as he tells the same story again with Luke, you'll <clears throat> see that he is exposing and lining out the religious world of his day. And in just a few days, <clears throat> Jesus would die on a cross on a hill called Golgotha, just out the city walls, uh, outside the city walls of Jerusalem. <clears throat> so he preached to some, some of his last sermons as he makes his way to this holy city. And he wanted everyone to know uh, that the religious Pharisees were literally turning people away from the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And so uh, as for Jerusalem itself, the city sat on a hill. And on a clear day, it could be seen for quite a distance. And as our Lord makes his way <clears throat> to Jerusalem, finishing this sermon, he turns and views the city from a distance, and he makes this heartfelt cry, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Just exactly what was meant by these passionate words of our Savior. I want you to notice three quick things here. This is for our guests. This is especially for our church here today, Franklin Road Baptist Church. 
What did Jesus mean by those passionate words, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem? First of all, we have some indication when we understand the city of Jerusalem itself. And I want us to look at that and think about that for just a while. The city of Jerusalem itself was a beautiful metropolis during the Lord's day. It was originally captured by King David and became the central city for all the Hebrew tribes. It was a holy city where the temple was built and God was worshipped. It was a place intended for all the tribes of Israel to come and worship there and make sacrifice before the final sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary. It was a place of high praise. It was a place of fervent prayers. It was a place of beautiful song. It was a city that had its share of war and crime. It seemed that every nation wanted to conquer Jerusalem and claim her, her for their own. And by the way, they still do today. As Jesus spoke these evangelistic words in verse 34, these words of witnessing, Jerusalem was being governed not by the Jews, but by the Roman Empire, captured and conquered for her sin. As Jesus spoke these words, Israel's spiritual condition was one of apostasy, you might say. They had turned back from everything they had believed about God and fallen away from everything they had been taught in the Holy Scriptures. As Jesus spoke these words, Jerusalem was inhabited by three groups, the Jews, the Gentiles of every religion, and the rapidly growing group of believers in Messiah. <clears throat> Today, 2017, Jerusalem is inhabited by the Jews and the Arabs and Christians. And so, in a sense, nothing has changed even today. As Jesus spoke these words, soon, historically, the city would be completely destroyed. And so, as I think of the city of Jerusalem, or any city uh, for that matter, even Murfreesboro, Tennessee, I think of its beauty. I think of the beauty of Jerusalem. I've already stated the beauty of our fair city here in Murfreesboro. I was just in San Francisco this past week, and with all of its crimes and its reputation and even its pollution, it is literally a beautiful city. The Bay Area countryside is breathtaking as the pastor drove me around. <clears throat> we stopped at a place called the Cliff House Restaurant, and and while we sat there in that fine restaurant and saw the uh, beautiful uh, sequoia trees, the huge sequoia trees in the background, we could see the rocks there and the beautiful Pacific Ocean crashing against those rocks. I was able to see a whale there uh, as it came up a few times there close to the restaurant. And that was magnificent to me, this, this uh, man from Tennessee. Um, Hundreds of sailboats dotted the bay. Surfers were catching the waves, and that's one thing I'm not and never will be. I'll never drown catching a wave on a surfboard. <laughs> First of all, I have more, enough sense to stay out of cold water. Amen. <clears throat> the Golden Gate Bridge and, and Alcatraz and the city from a distance was literally beautiful. But as with any city, uh, that city and our city, is filled with those without Christ. No hope of eternal life in heaven. In San Francisco, for instance, a city of over 3 million people, there's only a handful of churches that could tell you from the Bible how you can go to heaven. And by the way, that's the only way to find out how to go to heaven is from the Word of God. As we drove into the heart of the city, amongst the towering skyscrapers that were still being built, there was a very large Baptist church that sat on the corner. Nothing on the sign out front except the fact that they were Baptists, and one word, the word different. It was spelled D-I-F, the next line, F-E-R, and the next line, going the other way, E-N-T. And they were different, that's for sure. I asked the preacher if they still preached the gospel there, and he said because of, of the the culture that San Francisco is, I will not repeat in a mixed crowd exactly the description of that church. But they would not have a clue of how to tell anybody from the Word of God how to get to heaven. As we uh, sat there in that restaurant, uh, I, I was uh, 
uh, slipped out to the restroom and was confronted for the first time with a gender neutral restroom and I came back to the table very embarrassed and the pastor looked at me and he said this welcome to my world I want to go on record as saying that I thank God that our city our city here may not be quite like that yet in fact we are loaded with churches that still preach the gospel but may also say very quickly on any given Sunday which is still the Lord's Day multitudes stay at home from church and more and more people in our good city are falling away from faith and even in our good city sin abounds more than we could ever imagine we just don't like to think about it our jails are full and our police are overworked and taxed in their duties and I think about how every city needs the Lord every individual needs to hear a good uh, presentation of the good news of the gospel how they can go to heaven someday I want you to think about that as you think about the cry that our Savior had for the city of Jerusalem but number two I want us to kind of investigate that cry we look secondly at the cry of Jesus the city of Jerusalem and secondly the cry of Jesus <clears throat> with the indicting statement of the killing of the prophets and the stoning of those preachers that were sent to them Jesus is reminding them of how hard he has tried to get them to believe in himself the prophets of old spoke of Jesus and these men of God were constantly trying to get the people of this great city to repent and come back to God his double use of the word Jerusalem <clears throat> Jerusalem and the addition of the superlative the letter O in verse number 34 indicates our Lord's expression in this context here Jesus was passionately crying out one last time for the city to get his heart right with God the Bible says in 2nd Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 but uh, uh, speaking of our Lord is long suffering to usward not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance and may I say that history declares that Jerusalem continued to scorn the preachers of the gospel even after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and though the Apostles uh, turned the world upside down with the gospel as is recorded in the book of Acts we must understand that apart from the brief revival at Pentecost Jerusalem continued to persecute the preachers and scorn the gospel that is why history records that in 66 AD the Jews had had a gutful of Roman domination and they revolted against the Gentile Empire and uh, it was a mere series of skirmishes against Rome the mighty Roman uh, uh, soldiers until 70 AD when the mighty Roman general Titus systematically forced his way uh, into the walls of the city of Jerusalem and he destroyed all their fortification and pulled down the holy temple central in the city pulled it down just like Jesus said stone by stone ladies and gentlemen that is a reminder to all of us that the uh, cities have their zenith and cities have their fall but the heart of the city the heart of any city is not its structures but its souls the human beings of Murfreesboro the human beings today of Parkersburg, West Virginia, as the fires burn this week in the beautiful Napa Valley, just one hour from where I was preaching, you see the true crowd was not for the vines and the grapes or the vintage of the wine country, nor was their cries toward the tourism and the economy that it produced. That may be what the media was indicating. No, the weeping and welling cry coming out of Northern California was for the 40 plus that had died in those flames it was for the nearly 400 missing and entire towns and villages were gone because of the fire notice the phrase in <laughs> verse 34 this phrase sent unto thee he says he says oh Jerusalem Jerusalem uh, which kills the prophets and so them which <laughs> that are <laughs> sent unto thee that is very in, in, indicting sometimes people accuse God of having no mercy no 
No, my friend, over and over, God sends his messengers to the city of Jerusalem. Notice the phrase, the last phrase, but ye would not. These inhabitants here uh, that Jesus is preaching to uh, had had their chance to hear the gospel, but they refused the gospel. And like the <laughs> waitress that preacher and I had recently handed a gospel tract to, immediately she turned the subject of the gospel to the fact that she was more troubled about the invention of firearms and weapons and how they kill people. Now, you have to understand me being from the South, me having just a little common sense, I could have easily turned that around, but I didn't because the young lady was completely blind to the gospel. She didn't understand. Can I say that that is the generation that is around us right now that's been blinded uh, by the, uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And I want to say right here, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> that um, the God-given dignity of the free will of man to refuse Christ should never be exercised. Let me say that again. The God-given dignity of the free will of man to refuse Christ should never be exercised, for we do not know if we'll ever get a chance to be saved again. Someone needs to be crying over our city, whether people listen or not. Everyone should have the right to hear the good news of the gospel. And Jesus stopped his message <laughs> with a heart throbbing for the people he loved, he cried, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, why haven't you listened? Which leads us to number three, the compassion of Jesus. We heard his cry, and his heart cry was from his compassion. With his statement here of the brooding mother hen gathering her chicks to safety, he declares his compassion through illustration, just like those little chicks were innocent of the knowledge of the soon coming danger. They instinctively knew that when their mama cried out and raised that loving wing of refuge, they knew what that was, and they knew they better come a-running. And they knew that that mother hen <laughs> would uh, call them if they strayed too far. And they knew the love of their mother would defend those little ones from the piercing talons of the enemy with every drop of her blood and the truth is as human beings we have no idea of how bad it is really out there and how bad it can get out there nor do we understand the exact time of our trouble but God in heaven knows and that's why he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross of Calvary and he calls us to salvation he calls the lost and undone to the refuge and safety under the mighty wings of God Almighty and here he reminds the people of Jerusalem of their opportunity to be saved time and time again. May I say to you today that we come to another opportunity to come to Christ. I want you to notice again in the scriptures the word often. He said, how often would I have gathered thee, thy children together? Again, over and over, this city was given the truth of Messiah. And the scripture indicates that in the book of Acts and prior to that. Now think about our town here. You know, I don't know if anyone's ever knocked on your door and told you about Jesus Christ. I know that there are some that have a false news about that, but it's a pretty rare thing. And we're commanded to do that. I want you to know our church does that as much as we, as we can. But even in our town, you may not have had anyone knock on your door and persuade you to to be saved and you may have never had a co-worker or a classmate witness to you about the gospel but you have a TV and you have a radio and many have computers connected to the internet we have billboards along our highways and we have Bible bookstores everywhere in our southern little town and you know that that the, all those things are convicting and you know that opportunity abounds for you to hear and investigate the gospel of Jesus Christ without even anyone personally talking to you in our free society. Often you may have skipped past the channel on your TV where the gospel was preached. No interest there. Often maybe you've switched off the a radio preacher. Maybe often you have curiously pulled up that website with the gospel but then, then was blinded by the links 
to evolutionists and the humanist uh, doctrine that scorn and defy the very existence of God. Often you have felt maybe the spiritual pull of the Bible bookstore as you passed its doors in the mall, but you hurried on to your next stop just to kind of get your mind off the fact that maybe that may be true there, what's uh, stated in the Bible, just to, just to get your mind off the lost condition of your soul. Often you have maybe seen a Bible laying in the home of a friend or in the dash of a car that you're riding in, but instead of uh, it being a familiar presence in the room to you, it seemed to be an eerie and condemning thing to your soul. And all these things are witnesses. I'm talking about uh, opportunity after opportunity uh, that you have. Often you have felt the wooing of the Spirit of God, and Jesus says how often he said, I would have gathered you. God wants to gather you. You ever thought about that? God wants you to receive Christ as your Savior and gather you into a loving church congregation so you can learn the truths of the Scripture. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, the Bible clearly says, not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so we understand that the closer we get to the last days, people would forsake church and they would forsake the gathering, a gathering together that Jesus Christ commands us to do. Jesus is always gathering. He gathered the children. He gathered the disciples. He gathered the people. And he's gathering folks for heaven. The Bible says uh, <laughs> with the rapture, he wants to gather all of us to a permanent place, a permanent home called heaven, which the Bible calls the New Jerusalem. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 says this, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Again in John chapter 14, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's getting ready to go to heaven. And he said this to them, he said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come in, watch this now, and receive you on myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is looking uh, for that grand reception someday when he steps out on the portals of heaven, and he says, I'm ready to receive you into that eternal city and that eternal home. When Jesus made that statement, Thomas, one of the disciples, was standing there. He said, Lord, he said, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Boy, oh boy, oh boy, the most important question anybody could ever ask. He said, uh, Lord, he said, how do we get from point A here uh, uh, on earth where our feet are at to point B up in heaven that we always view as that beautiful city? And uh, he asked that question to Jesus. He said, we don't know where you're going exactly. We've never been there. He said, how can we know the way? And Jesus said this, listen carefully. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now listen to me. You may have heard of many ways to get to heaven, but there's only one way to heaven. That is through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. You understand that we're all born sinners. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says in the book of Romans, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we're all born that way. Uh, and uh, we've been that way ever since Adam and Eve were created, and they, they, they fell with sin in the garden. And so now we're all born into sin. Everybody, nobody is ever born ready to go to heaven. We all must be born again. Jesus told Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you must be born again. Nicodemus is a very wealthy person, and he came to Jesus throwing up all of his wealth and knowledge and ability. And Jesus says, Yeah, but you must be born again. You've got to be born the second time spiritually and the bible says we're all we're all born sinners and so if we die sinners we'll split hell wide open the bible says in romans chapter 6 verse 23 for the wages of sin is death the penalty or the payment for our sins is death and we don't have to go to hell we can all go to heaven if we receive the gift of life the bible says for the wage of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life through jesus christ our lord and i've never uh, even since a child I, i've never understood why people would not receive the free gift of eternal life. You say, preacher, I've heard about that free gift, but I've never really understood it. 
In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible tells us a little bit about the cross. It says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That word commendeth there means he proved or he demonstrated that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, the Lord doesn't want anybody to die and spend eternity in hell. He wants the world he created and humanity to receive Christ as their Savior, His only begotten Son. You see, Jesus Christ died for our sins on the cross. He shed His blood. You say, well, I've never really understood that. And I don't know that any of us would ever understand exactly the, the, why He used the plan that He did. But I can just tell you this. Ever since the beginning of time, the Bible says this, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There's no way that anybody can ever have their sins forgiven. You cannot do enough good works to get your sins forgiven. The Bible says all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. There's no way that you can do enough righteous acts to go to heaven. The reason why is because you're born sinners. That must be washed away. That sin must be washed away. We sing about having our sins washed away in our songbooks, but literally that takes place the moment we trust Christ our Savior. We trust in the finished work of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And we sing that to get us to understand that when we trust Christ our Savior, just like the blood of that lamb in the Old Testament took care of all the sins of, of the Hebrew children, uh, once a year on the Day of Atonement because Jesus Christ took the place of that Lamb. He was the Lamb of God which took away the sin of the world because Jesus Christ did that literally on the cross of Calvary on Golgotha just outside the walls of this city we're preaching on today. If we'll believe that, we can go to heaven. The Bible says this. It says, uh, <clears throat> If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. Then he goes on to say this, speaking of the Jew or the Greek, there's only two types of people on planet Earth, the Jew and the Gentile. That's all there is. So it doesn't matter. It then it says this in verse 13, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now listen carefully. Have you ever heard this? <laughs> you ever heard of somebody missing heaven by 16 inches? From their head to their heart? It's about that, that length. And there's a lot of people that have heard about Jesus. They got the knowledge of Jesus. In fact, the Bible says about that that the devils believe and tremble. There's a lot of folks that know a little bit about Jesus and know a little bit about the cross, but they've never been born again because they never cried out to God and said this, I believe in the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. I'm putting my faith and trust in you today. For whosoever shall call, that's a prayer, shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can I tell you this? Everybody in this room, everybody in the world that's ever been saved got saved the same way. You may have used different words, but I promise you, here's how you got saved. You got saved by believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died for your sins, He shed His blood on Calvary, that He was buried three days, and that He rose again. Again, the verse, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart, that God hath raised Him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. That tomb in Jerusalem is empty. We live in a very, very lonely and hopeless world. Even in our be beautiful city, people feel so lonely. We run on to them from time to time. As I listened to the news this past week, getting ready to catch my plane, they were interviewing the former Surgeon General and I was shocked with what he said, but it confirmed what I had been hearing. He said that in, in America today, listen carefully, there's an epidemic of loneliness. Then he said this. This is what is spurring the rise of drug addiction, opioid abuse, and the rise of suicide in our nation. Lonely people. And we may not see it as much here in Murfreesboro, but it's here. It's on your street. But I just came from San Francisco, and Pastor Alan Fong was telling me that once a week his members, members of his staff, will tie on a body cam, similar to what our police officers wear at times. And then they'll fill their pockets with gospel tracts and they'll head out to witness at what is called the BART system. The BART system is the 
Bay Area rapid transit system, much like the Metro subway in, in D.C. and the subway system in New York. And though they wear their body cams for safety purposes, they will often review the footage. One of his staff men told me, with tears in his eyes, he said, Preacher, it's not so much the rejection that we saw on that footage, people blowing right by you, maybe not receiving tracks, and people saying to you, hey, get a life. That's not the problem. He said, what you see on that video footage is this, the emptiness, the hopelessness, no smiles. You drive by out there in a house here that may cost $60,000, by the way, I know where I live would cost $500,000 there. And people will move into those homes, two and three families, just to make the bill, or they will remodel the garage just to take in some border so they could make the payments, and they get up two hours before daylight, and they go to bed two hours after daylight, and they, they live only to exist. And they come and go and come and go, and they sit in hours and hours and hours of traffic they have no other purpose in life but to live, eat, work. Live, eat, work. No vision, no goal. But can I say that I preached to hundreds out there that had the Savior. And they had a smile on their face. And they lived the same lifestyle. Fourteen different language groups in this church. But oh, how they loved Jesus. And oh, how they would shout when the cross was preached and oh how they would sing the old songs of Zion and they'd hang out late after church just to fellowship and howdy around. You say, what was the difference? I'm going to tell you the difference. They had a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And I'm going to tell you what you need today in your lonely heart or your heart that's filled full of maybe uh, of the lack of hope. What you need is Jesus Christ. And he'll never turn you away. And as Jesus and his disciples made their way to the city that he would die in, he looked up and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I've given you chance after chance after chance. And you walked away. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be just as clear as I can. This nation we live in is one nation under God. But being American is not going to take you to heaven. And as we watch our nation walk away from God the same way that Jerusalem walked away from God. It's time for us to pick up steam and get people to Jesus Christ. And you that are here today that have never made that decision, I want to lovingly say, would you join us? Would you gather with us as we march to Zion, as we gather in people for the harvest, as we tell folks about Jesus Christ, would you join us and be a part of the family of God? Let's bow our heads, please. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Thank you so much for listening today. Can you hear the heart cry of Jesus for Murfreesboro? Can you hear the heart cry of Jesus for your own soul? With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, can I ask just a few questions today? I wonder how many say this today. Preacher, I know I'm saved. I remember the day that I prayed and I was born again. Would you put your hand up real high right if you did? I know I'm saved. Got that settled. God bless you. Thank you. Many hands raised. I appreciate that. Now, there are different needs here. There are needs of people who are just, you're, you're born again, but you're burdened. You're burdened about maybe an affliction or a friend or a situation in your life or relationship. You're burdened. In just a moment, we'll have an altar call, and we want you to come to the Lord and just tell Him all about it. We have other needs here. Maybe you cannot lift your hand there because you have not settled that in your life. You're not sure that you're born again. Can I say that? I'd just like to pray for you. I promise you I wouldn't call your name out. I wouldn't embarrass you in any way. But right now with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, and no one looking, I want to say, Preacher, just lift your hand and say, Would you just pray for me? By lifting your hand, I would do just that. I would pray for you. Not sure that I'm saved. God bless you, man. Or the road. Just put your hand right up, right back down. Not sure that I'm saved. The Lord's calling. God bless you. Anybody else? Just put your hand right up, right back down. Not sure. I'm looking there in the balcony there. Now, friend, let me tell you this. God loves you with an everlasting love. And today's the day of salvation. 
would you come? Opportunity is coming by you one more time. We'd love to have you come to Jesus. We'll help you every step of the way. Let's stand together, please. Father, we thank you for uh, the word today. We thank you for the heart of Jesus. And the best way we knew how, Lord, we try to tell the folks about your heart. There is no way that we could know for sure how burdened you are, but we try to describe that. I thank you for the many hands that are raised of folks that settled their salvation decision, but Lord, we still have needs as Christians. And I pray we'll find ourselves a place here and pray for those needs and how you burdened us. And then, Lord, today you pass by again, and we pray for these who lift their hand that they're not sure they're saved. I pray that you'll help them to come. And Lord, I, I know they'll find a friend here that will help them come to you and help them to do just that, we pray, please, in Jesus' name. With their heads bowed, their eyes closed, here's the invitation. We're going to have somebody standing on the end of each aisle with a Bible in their hand. And they have that Bible, and they want to take just a few moments and show you how you can go to heaven. Would you do that today? And today, if you would just leave your seat, and if you're a man, a man will talk with you and pray with you. If you're a lady, they'll actually give you to a lady and a counselor, and they just like to take a few moments and pray with you. Christian, today, could we not do a better job reaching our Jerusalem right here? Would you let the Lord speak to your heart this morning? Father, bless as we sing this invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're singing right now. You come, would you? Softly and tenderly. Folks are coming right now. Just come right on. Let's tell the Lord what's on our heart. Today, if you're not sure that heaven's your home, would you talk to one of the men down front? Would you let us help you today? See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner. Come home. Jesus said often, often he said, I sent people by. He's sending people through here. He's sending today the gospel. Friend, you may come in church doors week after week after week, but you're burdened about your heavenly home. You're not sure about that. You do not have to leave this place without settling that. God wants to gather us. What a comforting thing. Let's sing this Next verse together. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon. Pardon for you. Listen to the chorus, the words. Let's sing it together. Maybe you know it. Let's sing out, would you? Come home. Sing it. Come home. Come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. And be seated for just a Father, thank you so much for your word today. And again, as we consider your heart for us, may we that are born again be so thankful and grateful that you came searching for us and you sent people to us and we received you as Savior. And Lord, I pray you'll continue to work in the lives of people today in our city. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
evening. God bless you. Thank you so much. It's so good to have a, a Marilyn Horn and also Brianna Gordon. Could I have you all stand right over here? And you all have prayed and trusted Christ to save you from the folly of believers baptism. Is that right? You rejoice in their decision to do that. Would you say amen? Amen. amen? amen. God bless you. Ladies, you'll slip that way. They'll get you ready to go, and they'll help you out there. And thank you so much for coming. And others today are being dealt with. We're grateful and thankful that while we have services going on in here, there are children's services and teen services throughout the buildings here. And so we're grateful as the Lord closes those things out in our Laotian Thai service and Spanish service. We're asking God to bless there as well. We have these to baptize and we'll sing or any word from our staff. Turn to hymn number 186, if you would please. Take the world, but give me Jesus. The loneliness goes away as we push away everything else, but we accept the Lord into our lives and we live for him. Let's sing it together. Hymn number 186. Take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name. But his love abideth ever through eternal years the same. Oh, the height and depth of mercy. Oh, the length and breadth of love. Oh, the fullness of redemption, pledge of endless life of. On that second verse. Take the world, but give me Jesus, sweetest comfort of my soul. With my Savior watching o'er me, I can sing the billows roll. Oh, the height and depth of mercy, oh, the length and breadth of love, oh, the full of redemption pledge of endless life of on that third verse take the world but give me Jesus let me view his constant smile then throughout my pilgrim journey light will cheer me all the while oh the height and depth of Oh, the length and breadth of love. Oh, the fullness of redemption of endless life. And on that last, take the world, but give me Jesus. In his cross, my trust shall be till with clearer, brighter vision. Face to face, my Lord, I see. Oh, the height and depth of mercy. Oh, the length and breadth of love. Oh, the fullness of redemption. Pledge of endless life. Of Turn just one page back to hymn number 185. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Our Lord Jesus Christ is that rock on which we stand, that which we can cling to. Let's sing it together, Rock of Ages. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure save me from its guilt and power on that second verse not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands could my zeal no respite know could my tears forever flow for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. This is Brianna and she has trusted Christ as Savior wants to follow him in believer's baptism. Brianna, in obedience to the divine command of Christ Jesus our Lord and upon Jesus. 
your profession of faith, uh, baptizing my sister in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Married in baptism. Raised to walk in the midst of life. as Savior and wants to follow him in believer's baptism. Marilyn, in obedience to the divine command of Christ Jesus, our Lord, and upon your profession of faith, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Married in baptism. Raised to walk into this of life in Christ Jesus. Amen. You rejoice in these ladies following Christ in baptism. Would you make it known by saying a good hearty amen? 